want to share with you out of John chapter 9 this, uh, this story about this blind man. And I have been deeply touched by what I've read here, and it's some very simple words. But, uh, and I don't know that I can put into all words what, what it is that the Spirit of God is saying to me about Christ. But I want to try to communicate that with you and uh, share with you. Instead of reading all 41 verses, <clears throat> I am going to trust that many of you know this story and I can make references to it. Um, but we can read a few verses. <clears throat> Uh, in uh, John chapter 9, verse 6, when he had thus spoken, this is speaking of Jesus, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way and therefore washed, and, and he came seeing. Also, once that he, you know, once he received his sight, <clears throat> A lot of exciting things began to happen. People began to ask him about the testimony of what had happened and everything. And, uh, but also the Pharisees began to get in on the situation. And uh, ultimately this man was kicked out of the synagogue. His parents, he was separated from his parents because his parents did not want to be kicked out of the religious establishment. They, it was, uh, you know, I mean, this was their culture. Everything surrounded this. Um, but this man was blind and, uh, you know, like many blind men, you're kind of a beggar. You're at the mercy of people that supposedly see. And, uh, then just these words in verse, uh, um, 36 and 37, he answered and said, who is he Lord that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Yes, thank God. There, there is a difference between see, seeing and hearing. This man had always heard about the Messiah. He'd always heard the things of God. He'd always been around them, never seeing them really by the seeing of the eye. Was he part of the family of God? Yes, he was. Was he part of the people of God in that, you know, in the world? Yes, he was Israelite. Did he believe in the true God? Already. Already he did believe in the true God. Did he embrace the things that God had given Israel? Yes, he had embraced all those things. But one thing really lacked in his life. He had never seen Jesus. And we always look at the fact that um, he was blind, and we always relate that simply to a physical healing. But the truth is, and the truth that God need, wants us to see, is that there's a greater need than just physical help from God. And many of the times our mentality is that we need physical help from the Lord, that that's it, whether it be healing or finances or, or to help me, you know, with the, on my job or whatever. We're needing a helper to help us with our lives in this world. But Jesus felt like he needed his eyes opened. And we'll probably read it at some juncture, but you're familiar with Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17 where he says that Paul is praying for the church that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. In other words, it is the church also that is blind. The prayer was for God's people to have their eyes opened. And the way that this affected me and the way that it deeply touched me was... And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. This man had his eyes opened, and he saw Jesus. He didn't hear about him. He saw Jesus. And when he saw him, he didn't, you know, say, well, praise God, now I've got the truth. 
When he saw him, he worshipped him, meaning that he must have seen something beyond knowledge, something beyond information, something beyond another teaching. Can anybody say amen? amen. Something beyond a lesson or a sermon. He saw Jesus and he worshipped him that he saw. I appreciate the way Jesus said to him, who, who is he? And he says, he that you see and have heard, that you hear, have heard about. And not just he that you've heard about, but he that you now see. Job was the same way, wasn't he? He said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now I see thee face to face. You know, I travel around a lot of places and I'm trying to share Jesus with people. My desire is that people know the Lord. And it is very difficult to put into words the Jesus that I see and that this man, can you imagine what this man must have seen? He'd been blind all his life, and now he sees, and he not only sees, he sees Jesus, <clears throat> and it elicits tremendous worship out of his heart. You know, I tried to describe <clears throat> to the Cuban people when I was there if they'd never had a tangerine. And we had a cold, fresh tangerine, and I'd eaten it, but I didn't bring one with me to Cuba, and I began to try to describe to them what a cold, fresh tangerine tasted like. And no matter how many words I put and how close I tried to get to it, you could never really communicate what that tastes like. You can talk about it. You can describe some sort of a picture of it. And people go, oh, that's good. You know, and especially if that, <clears throat> that tangerine, you ate it at a time when it just refreshed you or something. Well, the Lord is more than all of that. And trying to put that into words... And your words just seem so hollow in light of seeing him. And your desire is that your words begin to just give way to an intimate seeing of Jesus by those that are having their eyes opened. And, and uh, you know, but you, you just, even when you say, and even when the Spirit of God is on you to declare Christ, you feel that you're, what you're trying to express is just too wonderful for just words, you know, the lining up of words. And you know that what is important to those people or to you right here is not what I think, but the seeing of Jesus. Because when we see him, then everything begins to just start being made clear. It does. And it goes beyond, the, you know, a mere intellectual grasping of, of the, the facts and of the thoughts and of the concepts, the, even the concepts of Christ and him crucified and Christ as our life and we being in Christ and <clears throat> living by a life of another and the revelation of, even the revelation of Christ, the unveiling of Christ. <clears throat> There's no way to put put those things into word. It's, it's not, you know, someone can hear these concepts and grasp them and still not know Jesus. That's right. Still not be seeing Jesus. You see your own frailty and your own lack and you realize it's never about you. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to show you this contrast here in the, in the speaking of the tabernacle and the things of the old covenant. <clears throat> See if I can take this loose here and draw you a little picture real quick. The... Uh, as you know, the, the shape of the tabernacle, the way the tabernacle looked in the Old Covenant was sort of elongated, and there was uh, 
Outside was the altar and the laver, and of course this was all in an outer court here. <clears throat> the laver and the altar. Then you went in through a veil, but not the first, or not, not the main veil. And inside was the table of showbread and the altar of incense and the seven branch candlestick. And all of this is beautifully drawn by myself. <clears throat> and then there was a veil, and inside the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. But more importantly, inside the veil was the Lord. So let's read um, <clears throat> verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Did I tell you that? 2 Corinthians 3, 14. <clears throat> but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> a person, a priest, could come and could begin to explain these things. They could tell you how the labor or the, bre the show bread represents Christ as the bread of life and how you must eat that bread, and it is a partaking of that. And they can teach you all about that. And they can teach you about the altar. And they can say, you know, the altar represents the cross, and the altar represents all this stuff. And it does. But who can explain that the altar and the cross represent the Lamb in His nature? Who can explain that spirit in that nature? Who can truly impart that? I, I certainly can't. And so, and the, the labor and the descriptions of that and the seven branch candlestick and the I am the light of the world and, and the altar of incense and everything, all of these being the best attempts of, of man to communicate something that is not truly able to be communicated. We can fellowship in the words, but you cannot impart the revelation of Christ. We can, if you've seen him and I've seen him, then we can have fellowship even through our words because our words aren't really the key to that fellowship and communion that we're having. It is the life that we have seen. Those who are of like precious faith have fellowship. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's impossible to communicate it. Even if you can... Full, even if your, your, your descriptions are perfect, there's no way that you can communicate the Lord in that way. There's no way that you can open people's eyes. And so there's, it's, you know, there's all of this, but then there's this veil. And that's what these scriptures are alluding to is that there is this veil. And all of Israel could look at all of the, the outer court and all of the, the, the uh, things, the brass things and all of the stuff that related. They could, they could examine all of these things and look at it and talk about it and, and it'd be about God and everything they talk about being about God and everything. But the one thing that they lacked was literally going through this veil and there seeing the Lord and being changed into that same image. Man, they, the Pharisees knew this stuff. They knew every minute detail of it. It's like this, you know, it's like this, uh, you know, if this represented the altar of incense. And I say, this altar of incense represents the Lord. And, and, and this length here represents His long suffering toward us. And, and these legs represent the, 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 the stability that the Lord brings. And, and this burning of incense represents the release of worship. I can bring this up here, point this out, talk to you about it, show it to you. 
And you never worship. And you know what I mean. And you never really see the Lord. You hear it. But you don't see the Lord. You see this. And you hear the descriptions that I give. There's no change in the, His image from glory to glory as by this. There's only, there, you know, there's only a, a growing up in facts about Him that are more, my, more carefully worded. Maybe more according to the Scriptures. Maybe even more according to the Lord's heart. But my goodness, there is no description for what happens when the veil is rent and you look into His face and you are changed into that same image. You're not looking at something about Him, telling you the story about Him or giving you examples of long-suffering. You're seeing the One who is long-suffering. That's, that's vastly different than the, than the subject of long suffering. And if you're changed into that same image, the long suffering in, in you is a person not a thing that you study out. It's a, it's a transformation into another image. Not, a, not just a renewing of our minds in the sense that we think, a, a growing in facts and a, a, a grasping of the, the meanings of things so that we can communicate meanings of things. I don't want to communicate meanings of things. I want Jesus known and I want Christ revealed in His body. And I want people living by the life of another instead of doing the best they can for Him. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and turn to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians chapter 1, just to look at that scripture a little more closely. Ephesians 1.17. And I guess you really truly ought to start at Ephesians 1.15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The word revelation meaning unveiling. It is literally the same word in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And we'll just stop right there. Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Again, just like this blind man, he served the true God. The church at Ephesus were born again. They served the true God. They, they had the right Bible. They, they, were, they had the miracles of God. They had the help of God. They had the support of God. They were blind to the life that was meant to not dwell in a building, but in a people. Not to fill up the building so that we could all jump around and feel better, but to fill up the church so that He can live in His own body. Yes. Here it says, the spirit of wisdom. Not the impartation of more wisdom-y type of facts and, and cute cliches that really communicate nothing. Right. And that's the truth. They might get people excited because they never saw this before, but you're not, they're not still seeing it. They're only hearing about it. They're conceptualizing it, or you're conceptualizing it for them, and they're grasping the concept, but they are yet devoid of the seeing that makes you fall down and worship. And worship is bigger than just saying, thank you, Jesus, or praise God for what He did. Worship is where you're overwhelmed and this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yes. Yes. And you worship Him. What, what changes? What changes when the blind man sees Jesus and worships? What changes when you've been studying all the facts and all of the furniture and all of... What, what changes when all of a sudden... The veil is rent. What changes? Well, 
First thing, just the way the, the entire the entire way of perceiving God. It's not a God of religion anymore. It's a God of life, but it's more than that. You know, any attempt at, at this point to continue on is the same thing. But the, your way of perceiving God you just, you don't look at him the same way. You don't, you, don't, you don't see him cloaked in his creation anymore. It's not based on his creation. He was before his creation. Who he really was was not based on creation or based on these things. That's what I mean when I say that. It's not based on his creation anymore. It's not based on the, the altar of, of incense or the studying of these things. You see the actual. Those things, the God of preconceived ideas begins to just slip out. And, and the, the God of the reality, of the true reality that was and is and is to come begins to be established and to be seen for who he is without the dressing up of other things that are trying to, you know, like I said, trying to explain long suffering by some length and measure that we understand. But rather he takes us literally out of our understanding and into his. Literally out of our understanding, out of our perceptions, out of our preconceived ideas and, and, and begins to... I mean, we, you, just, you just step on whole new ground that you've never even seen before. You, you don't even know. You, we have not gone this way before. And that's what God said to Israel. They walked all through the wilderness and they got to the edge of the land and he said, pick up that ark and hold that ark up and everybody, all of the people of God, don't, we're going to go across this Jordan, but we're going to do it by looking only at him. And as we do, you, you know, the waters are going to be opened up and we're going to enter in and, and we're going a way that you've never walked before. But he said, Priest, lift up the ark so that they all can see him, so that everybody will be following him. Not you. That's right. Not you, priest. They're not following you. They're following you because you're following him. You're lifting him up. Amen. You don't follow a man. You don't follow men. You don't follow a teaching. In the name of Jesus, you don't follow a teaching. You become overwhelmed by a person. What can I do? Where shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the fullness and the reality of eternal life. You don't have to convince somebody, folks. You don't have to convince them if they've seen the Lord. You don't have to pump them up. You don't have to, you don't have to pet them and drag them and push them and, you know, or, or any of that stuff because... Their heart is running after the Lord at every moment that they know how. That He is what they want. Right. <laughs> He's the desire of their heart. But that's a, va a red veil. And all the old standards are done away. All the old, understand, do you understand when I say old standard, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about life before Jesus. I'm talking about all of the standards of measurement that we use to try to capture this one who was and is and is to come. The one who is the same yesterday, today. He's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. He's Alpha and Omega is the beginning and the end. The first and the last. And we go, I got Jesus in this little box right here. We don't have him. We don't, we barely know, I barely know him. But I want to know him and I want to know him more. Yes. And I don't want to waste my time. I want, yes. you know, I don't want to waste my time even, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't have to have somebody stand up here and share the pureness of Christ for me to sit there and get Christ while I'm listening and hear. It's a heart condition. Amen. That's right. And all that I'm talking about is a heart condition. I didn't even finish reading the scriptures in 2 Corinthians 3 where it said, or maybe I did, when the heart 
turns, when the heart, not the head, when the heart turns to the Lord. Look with me in Song of Solomon chapter 5, and I didn't mark these scriptures, but I think we can find them. Many of you are so familiar with these scriptures because I have shared on them over the years. Song of Solomon chapter 5, beginning with verse 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying. And this is, this is a picture of the king, which is Jesus, and the bride, which is the church. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. This is the Lord coming and knocking on the door for her. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with drops in the night. I have, she, here's her response. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand to the latch of the door and my heart was moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had, had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. And we'll just, we'll just stop right there. <clears throat> she has worked so hard to get herself clean or pure. Folks, the Bible says the bride hath prepared herself, right? Everybody's familiar? For him. She's not preparing herself. She's not trying to be more beautiful. She's not choosing things that sh and adding them to her that she thinks makes her more beautiful. She's finding out in his heart what he thinks is beautiful and it's changing her thoughts about herself and it's changing how she approaches herself. Am I right or wrong? You... You know, if a girl falls in love with a guy, you know, she, she can take several approaches. You know, there's this dumb show on TV, and every, it's so late, I usually watch it every once in a while. It's called <laughs> Blind Date. And, and people are incredibly blind. blind. <laughs> All of them have a measure already in their head. How are you ever going to meet the real Jesus? When you've got a standard, and, and all of them fix themselves up and dress themselves the way they think makes them look good instead of finding out what he thinks. And I'm really talking about the Lord, you know that. We're so busy religiously preparing ourselves that when he comes, oh, I can't answer that. I, I'll get dirty, I'll get messed up. I'll, I'll mess up the image that I have worked on for so long. And so he leaves and she goes, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I will, you know, what am I doing? He is what this thing's about and jumps up and goes and starts running through the city trying to find him. We have all these thoughts, you know. They have all these ways that we think that God is, you know. And, and uh, um, you know, she's asking everybody where is he and all this stuff and she can't find him. We always want to move to the familiar. We always, to us, the familiar to us. We always want to move to the familiar. We don't like to hear stuff too far from what we already have. Too far from, from, from what's comfortable for us. And therefore, we're always trying to force God on our ground. We're always trying to bring God to where we are. We're always trying to, to get him into our familiar territory and he can't draw us out. He can't get us to move. And Many times even when we're seeking for God, we're searching for God in ways that we expect him to be. There's no growth in that. We have expectations of God. I, here's what I want God to be like. Did anybody just hear what I said? Here's what I want God to be like. 
And if you'll check that out, folks, that's nothing but pure self-love that we love ourselves and we want God to be a certain way for us. Look over in the second chapter here, if you will. Verse, um, verse 8 and 9. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, gazing through the lattice. Let's read verse 10. My beloved spoke and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree put forth her, uh, her green figs and the vines, the tender grapes, and giveth their fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. She's standing behind her wall. That's what it says. She's got her little lattice, her little window. You know what a lattice is? This worked real good in, in, uh, in uh, Cuba because they all have lattices, just little wooden things that you turn like this and you look to see out there. And your view of him is only so big yeah. behind your wall, behind your little window. Well, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I don't care how much you see him. Even the fact that he came there to your window is still not the fullness. I'm telling you, there's a place where there's bursting forth of life, but it's not in your realm, it's in His. Thank you, Lord. It's with Him and His understanding. Your concepts of Him are still dragging Him to the earth, still making Him after the creation, still forming Him after your, the needs of your heart and your life, still working Him, and you're the... You're the you know, you're the potter trying to make him the clay. And we constantly cling to what we already possess. We'll never make new ground if we're clinging to what we already possess. We're so quick to take the easy way. I want, you know, the easy way. To know Jesus. Folks, salvation is free. Paul said, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Yes, you know that scripture. Do you really know that meaning? It doesn't cost you anything to get saved, but it costs you everything to know the Lord. And when I say everything, folks, you're throwing out your, you're in a boat throwing out your concepts. You're in a boat throwing out your, your preconceived ideas. You're in a boat throwing out everything to get to a place that, that you can't get there with all that stuff. You better throw it out of the boat or you're going to stay sitting in your little boat wondering why you're not going anywhere. Wondering what's wrong. There's nothing wrong right. in here, in the Holy of Holies. We say, I'm separated to the Lord. I'm separated to the Lord. I'm separated to the Lord in the furniture. I'm separated. I've studied the feet. I've studied the, the different parts. I'm separated to the Lord. Well, good. You're holy. But how about Holy of Holies? Yes. Total separation. It's a, it's, a, it's a different ball game in there, folks. You're, changed, you're totally being changed. That means all of you, not just your preconceived ideas are melting away, you in your image and your understanding melting away, being transformed into that same, S-A-M-E, that same image. The Spirit of God working on you. But down out here, it's easy to embrace a concept of God and not to embrace God. I'm telling you, there's a big difference between throwing your arms around a concept and throwing your arms around God. When that blind man's eyes were open, he worshipped. My God, I just can't get over it. I can't get over it, and I don't know that I'll ever get over it. He really saw the Lord. For God's sake, it wasn't a concept. It wasn't grabbing an altar of incense and hugging it. Or, or, or saying, oh my, the beauty of, of what this represents. The beauty of what this represents. The beauty of the Lord. Amen. You see the Lord. And it just starts, everything is just so different. Verse 
We need to really desire a glimpse of the Lord that is outside of emotions and, and human thoughts and ideals about Him, intellectual things. We have to move there really and truly in spite of all of those things. Those actually, really, those become your enemy. How strange, listen to me. God gave all of this. But as long as that veil is up, those are your enemy in that you'll, you'll never get to the real as long as you're just clinging to that. When Jesus died on that cross, you died. And when Jesus died on that cross, that veil was rent. And you're not who you are. You're not Mr. and Mrs. Special High Priest learning deep things and starting your ministry. You are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You are the vehicle of another life. You are an earthen vessel filled with a treasure and your job is to pour that life out. That's what you exist for. And if you fail the purpose of your existence, well, good. I'm glad you went to church. I'm glad you learned a lot of things and everything else. But where is Christ to the world? The living Christ, not the doctrine of Christ. Not the teach. He didn't come down here to make us teachers of Christ. He came down here to make us his body. The temple that he would dwell in and live in. So when people came, as I've said before, they're looking for the address of God. They come to you and knock on you to get him. Right. Knock on your door, your life, not your physical house door here. Hello? Is Jesus there? Yes, he is. And start pouring him out to people. But, it, but our, all these concepts, and especially if we value, you know, I mean, you could almost worship these concepts of God. And they're right. I mean, they're, they're incredible pictures. But, you know, you know, I've seen incredible pictures of seascapes going into somebody's house. And, and here's an incredible picture of the sun and, and the, the water lapping against the shore. And how, how beautiful that picture is. It ain't the sun and it ain't water and it ain't the shore. It's just the, it's a, it's the best picture you ever saw, but you can't swim in it. You can't feel the warmth of it. You can't put your feet and walk in the sand of it. But you can talk about it and you can paint it for everybody else. If I never am able to paint this picture for anybody, I want to feel the warmth of the sun. I want to be in relationship with life and to know him and to know him beyond my, all my understanding. The, 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 the teachings of man cannot capture this. The structures of man cannot capture this. The structures of man cannot capture this. This must come by revelation of the Holy Spirit. And you, you, I find myself realizing my words, while they might touch people because the Holy Spirit is behind them, they, a whole lot of words to me can just ruin the beauty Notice I didn't say ruin the purity of doctrine. Ruin the beauty that is the Lord because you can't paint that picture. It's beyond mental picture. It's just, you know, hallelujah. Turn with me to Philippians. We'll, we kind of quoted this scripture a while ago, but uh, I want you to see something here. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 verse uh, 10 and 11. That I may know him. Do you, have you noticed like Ephesians, he says that the eyes of our, that we may know him. This is all letters to churches, to Christians. Yes, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. 
being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. When we preach the message of Christ, when we share life, when we talk of the cross, and for example, when we talk of the cross, and we talk of our death with Christ, we talk about the fact that we're dead with Christ, and that Christ is our life, Soon as that goes forth, as soon as that goes forth, most people are trying, they're trying to know what death is. And they're trying to know what that means to them in their lives. They're not trying to know him in his death. Do you understand? I mean, if this is the cross over here and, the, and it represents the reality of, of him in this, most people are trying to understand that, not know him in his death. Yes. In other words, they're not trying to know him. They're trying to know death. They're trying to know the concept of death. And they're trying to apply that to this life. Folks, Know him in his death applies to you only as you are one with him and only as you are reckoning that as a fact. Yes. The only way you can reckon yourself dead is that way. You cannot do that in yourself. You, there's no way that you can reckon yourself dead except you know him in his death. Now you can walk around and say, well, I won't do that. I reckon I'm dead. But I have a feeling that you've just self-disciplined for a little while. No, this all comes together around Christ. Yes. And in fact, the scriptures are, are abundantly clear that, it must be, that he must be revealed in his death and his resurrection. That he must be revealed in his death and in his resurrection. And then we begin to understand ourselves. Then we begin to take our place automatically because we're his body, because we're one with him, because uh, uh, it, 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 it's fulfilled in a person, not in a thing. What things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. I'm telling you that until he's revealed, you're never going to understand all of these things. And, and there's a lot of things, you know. There is. I mean, aren't there? In the Bible, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of subjects, man. There's a, there, you know, and truths. But you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. You can, listen, you can, again, with these pieces of furniture, you can embrace concepts and truths, but you still don't know Him. Amen? Why? Because we set out to learn things and apply them to ourselves. We're out to learn things. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn things. And then we want to learn how to apply those to ourselves. We're not seeking Jesus. And, we, and yet, we are the ones that say we're seeking Jesus. Oh, wretched man that we are. Amen? We got to quit trying to Learn Jesus as if he's just another created object. You know, you're going to learn some subject. So you apply yourself. Folks, it says when the heart turns to the Lord. That's what it says. When the heart turns to the Lord. That means that it turns from you. Amen? Amen. It does. It means it turns from you. It turns from yourself. And instead of seeking answers, because folks, much of the answers we're seeking for it pertain to us. I'm telling you the truth. We're seeking answers. We're not seeking the Lord. We're seeking answers we're not seeking the beloved. 
the beloved. This is my beloved son. Not this is the answer to every human problem. No, the father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Therefore, all looking at yourself is not going to get you there. It's a, you cannot figure this thing out by looking at yourself. You'll never be able to discover him. You'll never be able to know him. The veil will not be opened while you're seeking to get answers for you. This thing is, is a heart thing. It didn't say when the mind turns to the Lord. It's a heart thing. It's a love thing. It's a desire thing. Those are not things of the head. Those are not things of the intellect. Those are things that have captured your heart. I just see that worship thing as, as that. A thing of the heart. They persecuted that poor man for seeing they persecuted him because he saw Jesus. And when he spoke of Jesus, he didn't speak the way they did. Well, this man does this, this and that. And he did this on the Sabbath and that ain't right and this ain't right. And he says, look, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not according to what you do. All I know is, man, I was blind and now I see. <laughs> just want to see, Lord. I just want to see. I want to see Jesus. I don't want to try to figure out everything. Figure, you know, that's a, that's a tough deal, folks. We're always figuring. We're figuring. I want to figure this out. I want to figure that out. I want to get things clear in my own mind. I want to get things. I want to get truths. I want to get. I want to gain. When, you, when that veil is rent, <laughs> yeah, he increases and you decrease. There is no thought of getting other than more of Jesus, less of me. And that becomes your, just your total heart desire. And so, you know, all these truths about long-suffering or righteousness or all of these truths, they were never meant to be something in themselves. It's like a person that's, that's uh, I, I don't know all of your backgrounds, but for a period of time, I was a missionary in Jamaica, and part of my responsibility was to take care of the chickens. And I, I'd never, you know, I was raised in Oak Cliff in Dallas. I knew nothing about taking care of chickens or anything. And so part of my responsibility was to keep track of them, feed them and everything else, and Man, I didn't know that, I didn't know mama hens could have so many chickens. I'm telling you, man, there were little baby chicks. We had a big old pen. And my, I was supposed to go back and tell how many chickens, how many little baby chicks there were. And they were running all over. They are running around and go, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. One, two, three, four, 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 And I mean, they're just like going nuts. They're moving and constantly. And it's like, how will I ever lay hold of all of this stuff? How will I get it? And the mom was in a little roost thing. And she comes walking out and goes over and sits down and fluffs herself out. And just, whoo, all of those baby chicks were right under her. It all came together when she got. Well, that's the way it is in Jesus. You can try on your own without having him as the central focus of everything and you're just trying to figure it out and figure out which one's what and where's this and how's this going and everything and you'll drive yourself crazy trying to get control. The best thing to do is just forget the chicks and start going after the Lord. No, I'm talking to you single guys. <laughs> <laughs> except that the Lord did say and I give you this permission the Lord did say out of the mouth of babes never mind. But folks, it really is true that when Jesus begins to be put in the center, it's, listen to me carefully, it doesn't start explaining everything. It, it comes by life. It really does. I mean, things that you tried to figure out and to put into work 
happen by life because you're one with the true vine. You're just a branch expressing and getting the pumping life of the reality working in you and it starts happening and you go, woo this is Jesus. You don't go, this is God giving me peace. This is, this is <laughs> Jesus who is my peace. Yes, there it is. Overwhelming me. But as long as there's more of you trying to get peace, you're almost expanding yourself. You're almost like living. You're expanding yourself, trying to get peace and trying to, trying to lay hold of something. When as long as it's you, you're not going to be peaceful because you're not a peaceful person. But He is peace. And as He fills you and moves in you, then the answer is Him. And you know that. You know that because none of it is attributed to what He gives. It is attributed to what He is in you. And I'll just close with this. Jesus said, come unto me. Just like that mother hen. Just come unto me. Come unto me, you that labor and are heavy laden. I, I have a feeling he wasn't just talking about physical labor. I have a feeling he was talking about Israel who had not yet found Christ in this way. Come unto me. I will give you rest. But you, he didn't say come unto rest. How many of you have tried to seek out rest? He says, come unto me and I will. Paul said, consider him. Consider him. Paul said, or the writer of Hebrews, looking unto Jesus. He described all of the heroes of faith in chapter 11 and then begins chapter 12 with, forget that now. Those were, those were the pictures. Those were the furniture. Those were the representations. Find Him who is the real. Go through the veil. And you'll understand the altar. Look into His face and you'll understand the labor. Not by intellectual knowledge. By what? I, I can't explain to you what the seeing of Jesus does. I can't explain. I can't put that into words. I can only tell you that when the heart turns to the Lord, all of a sudden, you're in a different location. The Holy of Holies. And you're more than in a different location. You're losing and gaining at the same time. At the same moment, the outward man is perishing. There's an inward man being renewed into the image of his son. You are taking on the image. And with that life and image, you are functioning now. Not by thoughts, but by life. Yeah, let's close. Father, stand with me. We'll just pray a prayer. Father, many of us in this place are well acquainted with preaching, teaching, sharing, talking, talking about the cross, talking about Truths, talking about things, things that are true. But Father, even as was said today in the worship, we must come back if we've left that place of fullness, of overflowing. David said, my cup runs over. David also said, Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, there is no wonder to the law unless we see Jesus. Father, I pray you'll begin to fulfill the heart of every one here that is ready to begin to turn. Turn from themselves. Turn from answers. Turn from seeking. Turn from trying to get stuff. And 
Not their head, but their heart will come back to you. Their heart will come back to you, Jesus. Beloved. Beloved. I sought my beloved. Father, when she began to seek her beloved, she found him. Father, help us to move away from the facts and to embrace our beloved. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.